Welcome to the Dr. Lumber Podcast, episode number 198. And this is part four in the Dr. Lumber Podcast's special interview series in The Road to 200. Welcome back to this special edition of the Doctor Who Alhambra Podcast, slotted in on our pathway to episode 200. In this mini-series, I, Legion, will be interviewing either Liam, Brett, or Humphrey, and finding a little bit more on how they tick. Today, in the hot seat, we have... Humphrey, hello. (laughs) Hello, Humphrey. Now, like me, you are one of the more recent hosts. Not as recent as me. Uh, You've been there for about two or so Uh, years now. I came in about this time in... 2018, I think. Oh, blimey, three years. Yeah. Fair play. So, yes, we'll get to find out a little bit more about you as Humphrey, because Mm -hmm. in our normal shows, let's be honest, you you are sometimes overshadowed by the bombacity that is me and Liam. (laughs) So, what we'll do, first of all, nice one that I have done for everyone, is, so Humphrey... Introduce yourself to our audience. Names, likes, etc. Well, uh, as you know, my name is uh, Humphrey Clement. Likes most food. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes, I do like my food, I must admit. Particularly, well, most things. I think the only foods I don't like are things like liver and kidneys and sprouts and baked beans. But apart from that, I eat pretty much anything. So yes, uh, I like cooking. Uh, I love reading. I'm a druid, so I work a lot with nature, crystals, um, that sort of thing. I am also a practicing complementary therapist. So I work, you know, I, I do aromatherapy, reflexology, massage, Reiki, all those sorts of uh, fun things. I'm fairly technical, not massively so you know i i can do what i need to on a computer or a phone or (laughs) whatever but i'm not you know super good but i'm not super bad either so yeah that's kind of some of me at least that's an intro to the enigma that is hump indeed excellent right so the main doctor who alhambra podcast is very big finish focused How did you first get into Big Finish? What introduced you? What was your first story? Now, this is a very interesting story because my introduction to Big Finish was kind of my my introduction to Doctor Who, really. I mean, the first Doctor Who story I heard was a cassette tape. Remember those? (laughs) Oh, don't I. They've come back into fashion like records. But anyway, I I digress. (laughs) It was a cassette tape of Evil of the Daleks with Tom Baker providing the linking narration. So that was my first introduction to Doctor Who, and I kind of quite liked it, but wasn't quite sure what to make of it. You know, I, I enjoyed it, but was a bit lost because the narration on those very early ones of the early 90s was a bit haphazard. It wasn't as clear and sort of descriptive as the more modern, you know, the the, the more modern ones are. I mean, you know, it had its nice aspects to it. So the next day, my brother came downstairs and he said, oh, do you want to try um, a Doctor Who audio CD? And I was like, all right then, you know, why not? And so he brought me down the Marion Conspiracy with uh, Colin Baker as the Sixth Doctor and uh, Maggie Stables as Evelyn Smythe. And back then it was a newish release because I got into Doctor Who in August of 2001 and the Marion Conspiracy uh, came in... When was that released? March of 2000. So it was about yes. a year and, year and a bit old. So I say newish, but I mean, it was new compared to now. I yeah, suppose. yeah. Just to make you feel old, Hump, that was 20 years ago next month. I know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I was the tender age of 10, would you believe? God. Wow. But, um, 
Now, I heard that story. And interestingly, <clears throat> I didn't know much about um, Tudor history at that time. I knew it a little bit, but not mm. anything, well, you know, much. And so I, I enjoyed the story. And I really felt a stronger sort of pull towards Doctor Who because I, I was getting to know the Doctor with Evelyn, whereas in Evil of the Daleks, I was kind of thrown into this story, just like, well, what, 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 you know, mm. who's, what even are these Dalek things? You know, I, I knew roughly what they were, but nothing concrete. So I heard mm. that story. And then I heard uh, my... Because I, Basil, my brother, gave me like three stories to hear in the, in the space of about a week. So these were my introductory stories. Um, I then heard Red Dawn um, with Peace Davison and Nicola Bryant. Mm, I swear um, the story. It's a very good story. I have to admit, it did. I wasn't sure what to make of it at first because, again, it sort of. I, I had more of an idea. But mm. again, it sort of throws you in a bit of the deep end, Red Dawn. But that's not a criticism. Uh, I still thoroughly enjoyed it. I just, there were gaps in my sort of understanding. The third one in this week that I heard was The Genocide Machine, uh, which is da- another Dalek story, with um, Sylvester McCoy and Sophie Aldred. And I really enjoyed that because obviously I'd encountered the Daleks before in Evil, and Ace kind of being a, not exactly closer to my age, but closer than, say, Evelyn or or even Perry, really, I could really identify with Ace, even though this wasn't like one of her first stories. She'd been clearly been a companion for a while, but I could really identify how she was feeling and but what really got me hook line and sinker was two stories later so the story i heard after genocide machine was phantasmagoria which is a story i really really like i didn't think much of it initially but i think it's there are some ideas in that story that are a little bit hard to grasp perhaps for a younger listener i mean i still enjoyed it you know i I thought that Nicholas Valentine was a good villain, etc. But the the story that really got me into Doctor Who, hook, line, and sinker, and I've not looked back since, was The Spectre of Lanyon Moor by Nicholas Pegg, mm. which is another Colin Baker and Evelyn story. And it pretty much follows on from the Marian conspiracy. And, I, you know, obviously you meet the Brigadier in there. Um, I really enjoyed it. It was absolutely smashing story and then i heard loads and loads uh of them and then i started watching them on uk gold <laughs> uk gold was my introduction as well of where well, it was my overall in- introduction to doctor who but I-, I like the fact that you've come to it from a different spectrum so can you remember the first tv story you saw after the cassette of evil i remember Initially, in my early days of getting into Big Finish, I did, Basil tried to encourage me to watch UK Gold. And I will not class this as my first because I only watched five minutes, five minutes of it. And to be fair, once Basil realized what story it was, he was like, yeah, that's not your best introduction to TV stories. Mm. I'll lend you another Big Finish. <laughs> but, <laughs> and that was Kinder with Peter Davison. Um, and that's... I've watched it since, of course, and actually it's not a bad story, but as an introduction to the TV story... It's... Yeah. Yeah, it, it's not the best. But it's not bad, no. My first... Well, because they used to be on at the weekends, so they I did. watched two, two. So one on the Saturday, one on the Sunday. One my on the first, Sunday. 7am um, yeah. for the four-parters, 6am for the six-parters. It was like that from the beginning of 2002. But in 2001, when I started, it was 9 a.m. N- n- no, no, it wasn't. It was, was it? Yeah, it was 9 a.m. for the four-parters. 
and the six parters. They just went on longer. So my first two stories, if you will, because I, I, it was my first weekend of watching stories, was um, mm. Resurrection of the Daleks and Planet of Fire. Oh, what an introduction. Resurrection yes. is very good. Yes, yeah, I enjoyed it, and 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 Planet of Fire. I would say, interestingly, at the time, and I probably would still say so now, Planet of Fire I enjoyed slightly more. Yeah, and then my first regeneration was obviously the weekend after that with the uh, Caves of Androzani. Mm. So, yes, and then I pretty much watched from then on, really, for a couple of years, and then. I sort of stopped for a while because I got into other things and then the, the new series came along, which reignited my... And I always was interested, but I, you know, I, when you're a teenager, you get distracted by... Well, even when you're an adult, you get distracted by other things you want to read or mm. stuff you got to do or whatever. But, you know, I always enjoyed it. But then the, the new series came along and so I got into watching that. So, obviously, Doctor Who is your main when it comes to its sci-fi fandom, mm. what other... I'm trying to think of the best way to describe this. What other shows, films, etc. have you partaken in? Do you enjoy? Do you follow? What, in terms of sci-fi or just generally? Oh, in, in, in terms of sci-fi and, you know, everything. Hold off books. I'm going to ask you about books later. I like mm. books, so we, we, can, we can make a good book <laughs> talk. Oh, that's good, because I have to admit... TV and film is not a huge thing for me. Now, since AD has, audio description has become a lot more of a thing, I do appreciate TV and film a lot more. But books are definitely more my thing. But as far as sci-fi goes, I really like Blake 7. That's a really good series. Um, I've obviously not seen it with audio description but for a lot of it you don't need it because it's they're often quite character driven stories earlier shows i find from the 60s to the 80s up to the mid 80s at least a very expedition uh, exposition driven yes so you know they, they'll do an action and they'll go oh my god why did you shoot him with that ray gun <laughs> exactly uh as for other sci-fi battlestar Galactica. I've not watched the original 1970. Well, I've seen bits of it, but I've not watched it properly. Uh, but I quite enjoyed what I saw. But the 2003 remake. Now that is one cracking piece of sci-fi. Cracking, I've heard that cracking sci-fi. It's. Uh, I have seen it more recently. You know, a few episodes with AD. But again, it was written so well that you know. AD obviously makes it more use, you know, you know, more, more, yeah. you know, immersive. But you could, for the most part, get what was going on. Because the reason I got into that actually was back in 2013, not long after I left uni, I went to stay with my cousin for a week around Christmas time. And it the weather was absolutely filthy. You know, it was absolutely bucketing it down from literally day after day after day. And we would go out for a bit, but most of the time we were like, oh God, it's, it's you know, horrible weather. So he mm. said, what do you think of Battlestar Galactica? And I, I never really watched it. I'd heard vaguely of it. And he, bless him, described the bits that needed describing because it wasn't available with audio description then. But we watched pretty much the entirety of season one and half of season two uh, in that week because we just we just decided to binge it because at the end of the day we didn't want to get soaked. And I just really enjoyed it. What I like about Battlestar is the fact that it's very character-driven. It is not typical aliens invade, fight the aliens off kind of thing, which I have nothing against, but it's nice to have a change. And what I find interesting with the whole concept of the Cylons, which are an enemy humanity has made for itself, you know, robotic servants that have decided to rebel. And, you know, that's quite interesting. And then the whole going across space to find Earth, it's a very, it's an interesting sci-fi series. I have to admit, Star Trek, 
I've tried. Some of the movies are all right, but it's not really my, I, I don't dislike it. You know, if, if someone, was, you know, if I went to a friend's house or whatever and it was on the TV, I'd watch it, but it's not, I can, I can take or leave it. I don't dislike it, but I don't get excited about it. Like, uh, and I kind of feel, well, a bit more with Star Wars that Star Wars, I don't like the Disney trilogy at all. Episode 17. <laughs> I just don't. I find certain concepts within it interesting. Like I, I really like the female Jedi, for example, but the whole thing is spoiled by the enormously pathetic Kylo Ren, in my opinion. Yep. You know, I quite like Rey. I think if she had a more interesting and believable villain to fight, she would have been a more interesting character. You know, I think... I think the essential concept was fine. It was just really not done very well. But episodes one to six. Yes. Episodes one to six are gold. They um, are very good. Now I can yes. I can certainly happily sit down and watch one of those. You know, that cold, wet evening in the winter, you know, get a nice glass of wine or something and or a cup of tea, and I can enjoy them. I'm I wouldn't I wouldn't personally like go to Star Wars conventions like i would say a doctor who uh, or something but i can certainly appreciate them and certainly enjoy them as for other tv slash film i love the series uh all creatures great and small uh based on the james Ooh, Harry books the original mm, yeah and the new one i love the original oh yeah the original i've not seen gold. the new one but the original is br- i'm slowly watching my way through it <laughs> it's brilliant isn't it Absolutely yeah. brilliant. I also quite like, you know, your period stuff, Downton Abbey, upstairs, downstairs, you know, things like that. I do like that. Films-wise, I, I, I like all the Tolkien films. There are various sort of more comic films. I've watched like Monty Python, that sort of thing. I've watched a few rom-coms that I've quite enjoyed. I quite enjoy the um, Jeeves and Wooster television series. I thought that was really well done. I love documentaries. I absolutely love documentaries, you know, nature documentaries, you know, like with Sir David Attenborough and others. I've always loved those uh, ever since I was Mm. very young uh, because I do have a big interest in science and nature. I like history documentaries, you know, all all things like that I really, really do enjoy. And I quite like the odd, like, cooking thing. You know, like... Master Chef and things I can I can enjoy. I mean it's not something I'd watch religiously, but if it happens to be on while I'm no. at my dinner or something. No, of course. I can quite yeah, happily no. get into it. And I must admit I am a bit of a sucker for the bake off. <laughs> oh my god. So my first wife religiously watched Bake Off. And I thought it was an absolute crock until lockdown happened. Me and Al got bored and watched the latest series of Bake Off. We then went back and watched all the Channel 4 series of Bake Off. We then bought the box set of series one to five of Bake Off and have binged <laughs> that. It is one of the greatest shows in the world. It is. And I think one of the reasons I really like it, and actually why I like MasterChef too, is that everyone gets on, everyone yes. cooperates. It's not about drama. It's not about, you know, oh, who's going to fall out in the kitchen this week? No, it's about doing what bakers or chefs or whoever do best. And, you know, on some challenges they work together and they're more than happy to work together. And there's never any jealousy if one person's yes. gone through and another hasn't. It's just... I just like the teamwork in it and the fact that everyone just, and if for whatever reason they don't get on, it's just a personality clash. It, there's no, and it's not dwelt on. There's no drama. Mm. Whereas you watch something like I'm a Celeb, which I will freely admit I do not like. No. Nope. It's just drama, 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 drama. And, but pointless drama. Utterly pointless. Point- staged. Yeah. Exactly. And I have to. There confess, is no reality in reality TV. No, it's completely um, unreality TV. To be mm. honest, 
And I have to confess, the soaps are also something I do not care for. Yeah. If I'm watching the TV of an evening... Oh, His Dark Materials is another series I really like. Do you know what? I've, I've not seen it. I've heard it's good. It's actually very good. I've not watched all of it, but I, I started it, but haven't watched all of it yet. But it does actually very faithfully stick to Pullman's work. Smashing stuff. So, we've spoken about television. Obviously, I understand you're not the, the biggest TV buff in the world. That's that's fully understandable. Let's move on to books and <laughs> audio dramas, shall we? A fun topic. So, I found when I lost the majority of my useful sight that I would pivot towards audiobooks and radio dramas more than television which is why I now have such a great love of books and audio dramas. What took your ear when it comes to audio books and radio dramas then? Well, when I was, I was born blind, so I've never had sight. And I was not the best Braille reader in the world. I was, could do it, but I didn't enjoy reading. But then from a very young age, um, because my brother's blind also, but older than me, so my mum and dad would get me audiobooks and dramas on cassette. So, like, initially, obviously when I was very young, it was things like fairy tales. And I remember some very good fairy tale dramas from the 90s that you can't get anymore, which is thoroughly irritating because I really enjoyed them. And I'd really like to listen to them again for nostalgia purposes. But they were narrated by uh, Richard Briers. There was a whole series of them. You know, you had Snow White, uh, Beauty and the Mm. Beast, Sleeping Beauty, King Arthur. You know, there were loads of them. And he narrated most. I think there was a lady who narrated some of them as well, but I can't remember who it was. But they were actual dramas. You know, you had acting and sound effects and music. And I suppose they were the first... (laughs) audio dramas I suppose I heard and then I got into the Enid Blyton books around the age of five or six you know Famous Five Secret Seven Mm -hmm. and you probably remember in the mid 90s a load of them were released as these one cassette audio dramas and you'd get like a double cassette box that had like two dramas in and they did that with Mallory Towers with Secret Seven Famous Five all of them Pretty much. I don't know whether you would agree, but I think they were very well done, actually. They certainly feature in my childhood a lot. I can remember them. Mm. And then uh, I listened to those. And I was like, my mum used to read to me a great deal as well. But then in 1998, um, I got introduced to the Chronicles of Narnia uh, and, and their Brian Sibley's radio dramas of them. Because uh, those were the most easily available audio books at the time. I think they had versions read by Michael Horden as well, but those ones had just come out on cassette, so you could buy them in every shop that sold audio cassettes pretty much. So my parents eventually got me the whole set. And then I found later on the Hobbit and Lords of the Rings radio dramas. So that's kind of where I got into radio drama. I've been a lover of it since mm. the 90s. Uh, and the same with books. I mean, I had all sorts of books, you know, from the library. I'd be bought them as Christmas presents. And, you know, one th- one thing that was always good, you know, as a kid, where, you know, if people weren't sure what to get me for Christmas, mum would always say, oh, get him something on cassette. You know, he'll love it, you know. And, a, a book. <laughs> <laughs> and she was right. And, but because of that I was exposed to a lot of different books. I mean, I was reading Dickens at the age of eight, you know, abridged, I grant you, because Mm -hmm. I did try reading Oliver Twist unabridged, but that was a bit much because it's very wordy. And Yes. um, But the abridged version, you you still get the essential story. I mean, I'm glad there are far fewer abridged audio books now, but that was what was available in the late 90s, early 2000s, so that's what I had. But now I read things like that. I mean, I, I even got into Shakespeare when I was... I, I was thought very weird at school because in year nine, I actually enjoyed us studying Macbeth. No one else did, but I oh, did. 
I love Macbeth. I think great it's play. fascinating. It's, I think it's great. I got to go and see it with my school. Uh, we got to go and see it live. It was it was amazing. Mm. Oh, it's a cracking play. I, I, I've not seen Macbeth live, although the version I will always remember audio-wise is the Archangel audio production, uh, which is full cast, all sound effects. It's a bit like a BBC radio production, but Archangel were a company a little bit like Big Finish, who kind of, mm. but their specialism was more things like Shakespeare and classical play, you know, classic plays. Yes. So that was their, so <clears throat> all the incidental music used proper orchestral instruments. The, the, these were made in like the very late 90s, early 2000s, whereas if you hear BBC p- plays of the day, they used a lot of synthesizers. Yes. The Archangel, am I right in thinking they're the ones that David Tennant did quite a lot of? Yeah, that's right. He only had bit roles. Yes, I've I've heard the Macbeth. It's, it's a very, very good. It is. It's very atmospheric. And, you know, you can tell whoever spent, you know, wrote, you know, adapted it for, for a purely audio experience really knew what they were doing and really knew mm. Shakespeare. I mean, the big Finnish Shakespeare productions are excellent as well. I've heard them, the Hamlet and the King Lear, and I'm incredibly impressed with them, I have to admit. I would love if they did Macbeth with Eccleston. Yes. I would also like them to do Romeo and Juliet. That's one of my favourite plays. Yeah, no, it's a good good play. My first experience of Romeo, well, my first experience of it was a short scene we did in English, but then that that was my first real time I, I got to like Shakespeare because before, you know, in primary school, I just thought Shakespeare was deadly dull. But my English mm. teacher, she was good at Worcester. She was really good. Her name was Natalie Hamer. She was a cracking, cracking English teacher. I had her from year seven to year nine. Very nice lady, mm. very good teacher. She always knew how to make her lessons interesting. And rather than just expecting us to read this scene, she actually told us the story and the context and, you know, what we were actually working with. And I was mm. like, actually... I'd really like to listen to this. So I went home on the weekend and I said to mom, can we go to the library? Because I, I wanted some more stuff to read. And she said, um, yeah, of course, you know. And I said, uh, "Can is there a copy of um, Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet on, on tape or CD? And she said, yeah, here's one. It's a full, proper radio dramatization of it. And I was like, yeah, great. That sounds good. And so... <laughs> I I got into Shakespeare off my own bat. It was really quite strange. And at that time, I was also getting into Sherlock Holmes, um, the BBC dramas with Clive Merrison and, 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 and Michael Williams, which I really liked. But no, books, and another area of books that I've loved from a very young age and still love to this day, uh, even probably deeper this day to this day now than I did as a kid, are myths, legends, fairy stories, folk tales, all of that sort of stuff. I mm. love it. I suppose because it feeds into my pagan spirituality a bit as well. But regardless, I just love them. You know, the Greek legends, Egyptian, Norse, Celtic, King Arthur. You know, all of those things. Uh, Grimm's fairy tales, Hans Christian Andersen, Joseph Jacobs. All of that. Brilliant. As a side note, have uh, do you listen to many podcasts? Uh, a few. I've sort of dipped in and out of the podcast world, but I've like, heard a few pagan ones, a few Doctor Who ones, a few just what? random things that I've just found. <laughs> there is a podcast series that I think would be very much up your street, um, and it's called Myths and Legends. It's by, uh, by a chap called Jason Weiser. Oh, yes, yes, I have seen that one. It's brilliant, isn't it? It's phenomenal. I've genuinely followed him from the start. It is outstanding. It is. He's up to, like, episode 260-odd now. I've been known to just, if I can't sleep, just trawl around on the podcast app and find the most random subjects possible and and listen to an episode on it. And it's really quite interesting sometimes. Yeah. So... You've you've spoken about books, you've spoken about TV and film and radio drama, 
Uh, you've touched a little bit on your education. Now, my question here is, quite a lot of your likes, you've mentioned your brother. Hmm. Do, you, do you think you gain quite a lot of your likes from your brother or have your parents had, a, had an influence on them as well? Now, that's a very interesting question. Doctor Who, I certainly got from Basil. Um, my parents mm. didn't hate it, but they didn't particularly care for it. And and certain book series like Sherlock Holmes and, and stuff I got from him. But my parents really got me into things like The Old Creatures, Great and Small. I've read all the books. Dickens, mm. uh, the Gerald Durrell books. I got into Harry Potter. Well, that was a Christmas present, but my mum and dad and Basil. And we, we just decided to listen to it when because it was given to me by my aunt and uncle. And one very cold uh, was the day after Boxing Day. We would just all snuggle around the fire. So they said, oh, put that book on. And we were literally, this was like 11 this time, so 11 o'clock in the morning. We finished it at 8 in the evening. <laughs> um, but so that was kind of a, an influence for all, all, all four of us. But no, mum and dad were really the, influence for things like mythology historical fiction i love historical fiction um mm-hmm. ironically i didn't much like learning history at school but as soon as i stopped having to study it i got into it <laughs> <laughs> yeah, always the way so it's it's been very much uh, uh, a mixed thing i mean later on obviously certain things i found myself i mean thanks to liam i really got into westerns i really like westerns particularly the yeah he's to blame ones. For me. Yeah. <laughs> well, they're just good stories, aren't they? And the villain get, always gets dealt with satisfactorily. Do you know what? Westerns are a very paint-by-numbers affair, but it's a very enjoyable paint-by-numbers with sparkly bits. Yes, exactly. You kind of know what's going to happen in any Western story yeah. you read, but that's kind of why it's so good. <laughs> yes. Because it's not boring. Yeah. No, you know, it's not at all. And you know it's going to end happily as well, which to, to me, yes. I cannot bear um, sad endings. <laughs> well, there's, I mean, there's far too much sad endings in the world as it is. Exactly. So if you can go to a story with a happy ending, and even though it may start out as bleak and desolate, you know it's going to end happy. Exactly, exactly. And that makes such a difference. Uh, you know, because I mean, you've only got to look at Lord of the Rings. I mean, it's this cataclysmic beginning, <laughs> you know, with the Dark Lord going to take over the entirety of Middle Earth, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, blah, blah. And yes, the ending is very bittersweet, but it's a very happy ending, all things considered. Yes, it is. And you mentioned the Brian Sibley dramatizations earlier. Mm hmm. Aren't, doesn't he bring that across so well in the series? Oh, my word. That series is absolutely smashing. I actually got to hear on YouTube um, a three-hour-long interview with Brian Sibley by, done, done by a chap called Nerd of the Rings. Uh, and that, I tell you, was fascinating because, you know, he talks about how he made you know helped make the dramatize the thing with michael bakewell and so on but you also learn how much that production actually influenced the making of the films because i have to be honest when i when i first watched the films uh of the lord of the rings way back in 2004 or whenever it was i didn't like them because they were very visual yes but then they they are about seven or eight years later I had the opportunity to watch them with a friend with audio description. And oh my word. Oh my word. The difference is staggering. It's And then I'm like, I was like, why didn't I like these? These are brilliant. Yes. (laughs) But I don't, I don't know if you noticed in the film, who plays Bilbo? It's Ian Holm. Yeah. It's Ian Holm. Who did Ian Holm play in the radio drama? Frodo, which is Frodo it's a nice indeed. Touch. It's such a nice. It is. Touch. It's, it is. It's. It's a purposeful touch by Peter Jackson as well. It is. But now you see, and I, I managed to see the Hobbit 
with audio description as well when it, when that came out because that came out later. Oh, so. I feel sorry for you. I saw it too. I love it. What the Hobbit film? Yeah. Oh, okay then. Hump. Come on then. Let's let because. I don't agree with you on this, but this isn't about me. Come on, sell us The Hobbit. Well, the reason I like it is because Peter Jackson actually wove some threads into the films that Tolkien had originally written, but the publishers didn't want in the original text. So it was all Tolkien's work. There was there was some creative license, of course, but... I like the fact that Thorin had a proper nemesis in Azog the Defiler, rather than just him being killed by a random arrow or something in the Battle of Five Armies. It was actually because... I mean, I know that's what happened in the book, and that's fine, but I like the fact that in the film he... You know, there's that heroic fight between him and Azog, and the fact that you actually... Because if you remember in the books, Thorin sort of gets greedy and stuff and then he suddenly changes and comes out of the front gates and, and joins in the battle whereas in the films you actually see why he changes and how he changes and I can see why people don't like the films but I have to say I do I think it sticks to the original story very very well I, I just genuinely enjoyed them and again when I watched those I appreciated the Lord of the Rings even more, you know, now I've watched all of it with AD. I'm like, how did I not like the Lord of the Rings films, you know? But it's understandable why I didn't, because I didn't know what was going on half the time. And I love the books too. But for me, both The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings, the radio dramas are generally what I go back to. And it's not necessarily because they're shorter, because if I decide to read the books, then I read them in their entirety. You know, it'll mm-hmm. take me a couple of weeks, but I do. And I thoroughly enjoy doing it too. But the dramas of both are just, they're so different and yet so well done. Yes, they are. And they both are phenomenal with their sound engineering. Mm. So you've mentioned you, you've read the books. I'm mm. assuming the, the Rob English versions. Uh, yes, but I have heard very recently the Andy Circus version of The Hobbit. The 16th of September is when the Andy Serkis version of The Lord of the Rings is out. Ooh, that'll be interesting to read. All three of them on one day. Nice. So, yes, if you have Audible, may I suggest saving some credits? I fully intend to, because I have the Rob English versions, and I do actually like them very much, because Rob English... (laughs) He's an older narrator, but he almost has, you know, you almost have the feeling of being sat around the fire and him just reading the story to you. There's something rather nice about that. But I do like the way that Andy Serkis reads too. From my understanding, Rob Inglis is also a Tolkien scholar. Yes. That's how he got the gig of reading them, which I think is fascinating. I think it's fascinating that in this modern age, we can have scholars who focus purely on authors who, in the grand scheme of history, didn't die that long ago. I know. It's amazing, really. I'm, I'm, I, I wonder if they'll be like J.K. Rowling scholars in the future. <laughs> well, it's yeah. entirely possible. Or Philip Pullman's scholars, or, <laughs> you know. Yes. So, in regards to your books... Let's do a list. I like lists. Mm-hmm. What are your five greatest influences book-wise that you have loved and you go back to? Well, we've discussed two of them, uh, and that's mm-hmm. uh, Tolkien and, uh, and J.K. Rowling, so Harry Potter and the, the Lord of the Rings stuff. Um, I love those because, again, there's just so much to them in those universes and yeah they may have originally been written for kids but there is so much for the adult in them too in both series they're so different but there is so much for the adult in them i think i appreciate harry potter particularly i appreciate even more 
as an adult than I did when I was nine years old when I first started reading it. Mm. But other books that have been an influence on me. Well, one author, I would say, certainly for my love of nature, would be Gerald Durrell, because he wrote books such as My Family and Other Animals, um, Beasts in My Belfry, The Overloaded Ark, Rosie is My Relative. And, and they are, well, they're all about animals, essentially. My Family and Other Animals is the first in the Corfu trilogy, which is all about Gerald Durrell's childhood growing up in Corfu. And it just talks about the mad things that go on because he's always bringing wild animals of various kinds home and his family get cross. Mm. You know, they are hilarious. They are absolutely hilarious. And, you know, but also you, you learn a lot. And then his, one of his fiction books, Rosie is My Relative, is a hilarious story set in the late Victorian period about a man who inherits an elephant that uh, has a penchant for alcohol. And that is just that is just a laugh a minute. That story. and it's written beautifully. The way he writes is just like he describes this man's landlady as having great voluptuous roles of avoir du poids. And that description just I don't know, it just makes me smile. You know, it's just the way he <laughs> writes. Do you know what I mean? It's just Yes. It's the most ordinary thing. But the way he describes it is so funny. Um, yes, a bit like the Sir most eccentric. Yeah, mm, but I love things like that. I love stuff that is written, you know, especially if it's going to be comical. Which that book is comical. You know, there's no bones yes. about it. It's meant to be. It is yeah, one yeah. of the funniest books I've ever read, quite frankly. And I, I read it a <laughs> lot. You know, at least once a year. Yeah. But his nonfiction stuff is great. And I just learnt so much about the natural world and everything from those books. And But he's not sort of lecturing you. He's just telling you these stories of what he does and how he does it. And it's just yes. wonderful, wonderful reading. I don't know if you've read any of his stuff, but... I haven't. I've always... It always comes up in my suggested things on Audible, but I've never got round to it. I would probably put in with those because, in in my opinion, they're sort of in the same camp, really. The James Herriot books, because again, they're written beautifully and, in many places, hilariously funny. And then there are other times you're absolutely bawling your eyes out. Yes, <laughs> yes. So, um, yeah, that's been quite a strong influence in my life. And then, of course, I would actually say that Doctor Who has been a very strong influence in my life because obviously I didn't really get into the novels when I was much old until I was sort of in my teens because they weren't available to put in. No, audio. it was 15 years ago that the new Target audio mm. range began. It was uh, 2007. So, yeah. 2007. Wow. Yeah, nearly 15 Yeah, 2006 or so. Pyramids of Mars was one of the first ones, if I remember correctly. But for me, growing up, um, certainly from the age of 10 onwards, in many ways, the Doctor was a bit of a role model for me. You know, know, there were plenty of others in my life. This is just how I felt about it at the time, and to an extent still do. I mean, because the Doctor embodies decency, fairness, compassion, you know, doing the right Mm. thing, you know, and just trying to do your best. You don't always get it right, but as long as you do your best, that's all that can be taught. You know, there's so many lessons in Doctor Who. I mean, I don't know how you feel about that, but I think there are. I, I, I would completely agree with you on that front. I think Doctor Who is an excellent moral compass. Yes. But I think what I like about Doctor Who in that regard is it's a moral compass, but it doesn't matter what your your sort of beliefs are, you, you know, your faith, mm. your whatever. It's good regard, you know, it transcends any of that because it's all, to me, it sort of embodies many things that pretty much any 
spiritual teaching around the world will try and do. Yes, it does not discriminate. Exactly. And that's why I like it. It's, it's, the, it's as inclusive as you can get. Yes. It's also... Now, I don't, I don't know how much drama you've gone through in your life, and, but certainly me, Liam and Brett have touched upon this because, in all honesty, we're, we're a bit more damaged flowers. But um, <laughs> through the dark times... It's been there for us, and it's got us yes. through quite a lot. Oh, I concur completely. I mean, when I was 25, I went through a horrible, horribly abusive relationship. I was with a partner who she was, you know, verbally, physically abusive. And I was an incredibly dark place. and. Doctor Who, amongst other books, but a lot of Doctor Who, you know, helped me because I could escape and I knew in that world everything would be okay. And when I was listening, I didn't have to think about it. And it's got me through one or two other dark patches in my life when I was younger. It got me through a dark time I had at university when I thought I was going to fail. You know, so, and where my dad effectively called me a failure. And, you know, I, you know, that helped a lot, you know, just the idea of, you know, that TARDIS that can just take you literally anywhere and any when. Anywhere and any when, yeah. yeah. And it, it, it is, it is pure, unadulterated escapism. But that's beautiful. It is. It's an absolute absolutely beautiful concept and an absolutely beautiful fact that this silly little program with not much budget for the 1960s is first of all still going today secondly has millions of fans across the world and thirdly means so much to so many people in so many different ways exactly and That's what I mean. It can mean so much to any person. You know, if they're a Doctor Who fan, it doesn't matter where in the world they're from. And what it would mean to someone, you know, from, I don't know, South Africa versus someone from Scotland may well be completely different, but they would still connect on a deep level because of Doctor Who. Yes, very much so. Very wise words, Hump. And one thing I noticed when Liam and I went to Big Finish Day, we weren't treated as blind people. We were treated as people yes. and as Doctor Who fans. You know, everyone was just nice to us. You know, there was one time Craig had to go to the loo and we needed guiding somewhere. So, you know, someone just grabbed us and off we went. I got yeah. incredibly starstruck that day when I got hugged by Katie Manning, but that's another story. <laughs> <laughs> She's she lovely. Is. She's, you know, I, I have only, only met her through Zoom and very, very briefly, mm. but she is one of the world's greatest She people. is. She is just lovely. I tell you, when you hug her, you can you there's just such a warm gentle wonderful lovely energy coming from her i literally couldn't speak oh <laughs> literally couldn't speak but oddly i she's like to. the world's greatest mad old woman yes she is iris wild time she is <laughs> definitely but um <clears throat> no. yeah no doctor who is definitely a big, big influence on my life and probably always will be, I think, with all these mm. that I've just mentioned. Your fifth, the fifth one is slightly more complex because in an odd way they combine, but in other ways they don't. Um you heard me mention my love of mythology and 
stuff earlier. Mm. So that is one influence because it influences my spiritual understanding of the world. But also I find mythology is, again, a wonderful place to escape to. You know, you, you're feeling down and you hear about the heroic deeds of Perseus or Theseus or somebody like that. It's going to make you feel better. It's just going to. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So in that respect, mythology is yeah. such a wonderful thing. And the fairies, and, and fairy tales the same, you know, because they all end happily and there's always, you know, that sort of element to it. So again, those sorts yeah. of things have been invaluable for me in dark times. But the other avenue with this last category is the classics, Dickens, Bronte, all of those, Shakespeare. and. I love the classics because they're good stories. They've withstood the test of hundreds of years and have not, Mm. you know, if anything, they've improved. And there have been some truly marvellous radio dramas done of Dickens books and things like that. I know it sounds a bit strange that I would put classic literature from Victorian Britain in the same category as ancient Greek myths or something, but to me they do connect in an odd sort of way. Well, it is an odd sort of way, but I get where you're coming from because they're from the past. Yes. You know, and how did we get to where we are today without the past? Yes. And exactly, and the past influences us so much. I mean, I, if you probably remember, I said that I didn't like history at school. I couldn't see the point of it. But you don't when you're 12 years old or something. But as an adult, you do. Mm. But no, but as I say, the whole mythology fairy tale thing, that's such a multi-layered thing for me. It is so, there are so many nuances. I think we'd need an entire podcast to explore that alone. (laughs) (laughs) I hear a spin-off. <laughs> well, we can do one if you like. <laughs> but do you know what I mean? It's a subject like that is so nuanced. No, I completely get you. So nuanced. So we've spoken about books, films, audiobooks, audio dramas, TV. Now you mentioned at the very, very start you are a fan of food. I am. So am I, although my good lady wife doesn't let me cook it because I will kill us all. <laughs> Dear. Um, you mentioned, you mentioned, you know, I am, I am that bad at cooking that I'm not allowed to take sick days with food poisoning. Oh dear. Yeah. They know how notoriously bad I am at cooking chicken or just eating it raw. Oh dear. That's not, a, I mean, so I'm not, you know, I do actually enjoy cooking. I mean, I've never, I thankfully haven't eaten raw chicken. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's it's not a good thing. So you mentioned you like food. You mentioned you like dabbling in cooking, which I'm sure is a damn sight better than mine. <laughs> what would you say is your favorite food and thing to cook? Because I, I when in the podcasts, you always mention these extravagant elevenses and afternoon teas that you have. And I'm like, that sounds amazing. Um, well, a lot of those I haven't cooked. <laughs> They're like, if I've gone out to the coffee shop or whatever and had a piece of cake or something, mm. they happen to do a particularly cracking rocky road at that place. But this is a hard thing to choose my favourite food. There is just so much I like. Probably one of my favourites, at least, is a, a, it's simple, but it's nice. It's a good pork pie. I love a nice pork pie. It's just filling, tasty. And then to wash it down, perhaps a nice slice of fruit cake. Oh. Um, but pretty much any cake will do. I just <laughs> do like fruit cake. But as far as cooking's concerned, fair, fair. I love cooking a good stew or curry or, you know, something like that in the slow cooker. Yes. You know, things like that. But generally, I find work. Uh, They taste good. Uh, And touch wood, I haven't poisoned myself with one. (laughs) (laughs) uh, I love baking bread. Uh, I have a bread maker uh, and I love making my own bread. Oh, really? Yeah. Because, you know, at the end of the day, I mean, you know, I, I 
perfectly happy to eat shop bought bread, but it's nice to make your own, you know? And mm. you know what's in it. You can put all sorts of interesting nuts and seeds in it if you want to. You can put spices in it, herbs, cheese, anything, which yeah. is what I like about it. You know, it's it's the world's your oyster as far as it, that's concerned. And shortbread is another yes. thing I love to make. Now, Al makes a very good shortbread. Mm-hmm. And she only she only did dabbled in baking last year. But her ginger biscuits and her shortbread are amazing. <laughs> and when she starts using the Paul Hollywood book that she demanded for Christmas, I will be very happy. <laughs> Excellent. Now, you, you mentioned you like a good tipple as well. Now, personally, I have actually very, very recently stopped drinking. Ah. I used to, you know, dabble. Well, I used to get absolutely wasted. <laughs> And then I drank, you know, in moderation and kept my head cool. But I've, I've just given up recently because it brings me no enjoyment and a sore head in the morning. So, but I fully appreciate people's tipples. I was a fan of whiskey. So let us know what tickles Humphrey's pickle when it comes to a good tipple. I'm not a big drinker i don't like the feeling of being drunk so i rarely drink mm. to being to the point of being drunk I, I do like a nice beer i must admit a nice lager in the winter i do like a good real ale i do love a nice glass of port i must admit uh and uh, like you i like a whiskey now and then and a glass mm. of like rosé or something that's always go goes down well so those are the sorts of things and cider i do however like Baileys, particularly in a pudding, but on its own as well. Ooh, now talking to Baileys in a pudding, mm. if you have a Frankie's and Benny's near you, oh. their Baileys cheesecake is awesome. Ooh, I have to try that. It is genuinely amazing. And if you have a Tassimo mm. coffee maker, um, you can actually, at Christmas, get Baileys hot chocolate and Baileys coffee. Oh, well, I, I don't have a... Tassimo, but I have a filter coffee maker and I have been known in the winter to put a shot of Baileys in my coffee. Shot of Baileys in it. Yes. Good man. (laughs) Now that goes down a little too easily, I must admit. Yes. Yes, it does. You know, you just forego milk, don't you? You're just like, right, this has got milk in it. Let's use this. Exactly. I have to admit, one does tend to turn into two or three if I have those. <laughs> but at the end of the day, it's usually around Christmas time, so it doesn't matter anyway. Yeah, no, let's be honest, December is just a write-off for food and drink. <laughs> exactly. So you've mentioned you, you're a fan of the old pork pie and the old, old slice of cake. What would your ultimate main meal be? Three course. Probably... Tomato and basil soup with a thickly buttered crusty roll, for starters. For my main, steak and ale pie with a massive mound of mashed potatoes, peas, carrots and parsnips. And for pudding, probably treacle tart and custard, or treacle sponge and custard, something like that. Oh, you're talking dirty to a fat man now, Hump. I'm not the skinniest human being on the planet myself. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for today. It has genuinely been enlightening because when it comes to the main podcast, you, you are normally quite quiet compared to the rest of us. Yes. You're normally the one sat in the corner going, come on, children, calm down. <laughs> I will turn this podcast around. <laughs> Uh, yes. But I am wholly and solely with Brett on the fact, discussing books with you, we need to make up a Humps Book Corner. Oh, thank you. I'd enjoy that. So, yes, I, genuinely, I think even if it's a 5, 10, you know, however long segment, I think you, you would do excellent as that. And I think it would give you a time to shine as you. Because when you're only being interrupted by one of us, i.e. me in this, you shine through. Mm, thank you. No, not a problem. I suppose I... Like, like I've said with... I, I, you know, I, I, I am sort of 
I can be talkative, but I can also be quite a, a quiet person, I suppose. But I have to say, this has been thoroughly enjoyable. I said this to Liam and I said this to Brett as well, because the understanding he's got about them were brilliant. And it's the same with you. Thank you for your time. Oh, my pleasure. I've really Thank you it. for your honesty. Excellent. I, I, I mean, I don't, I'm not the most intimidating. Although, apparently I am quite intimidating, according to, according to a parent at Olivia's school. Oh, really? Oh, goodness. Yeah. Oh, yeah, apparently. It's because I'm quite large. Oh. And she just, she hates men. Oh, okay. But, um, no, uh, I've tried not to be intimidating at all in any of these. I've tried to try to ask questions where I can yeah, of course. to get the best out of you. And you have genuinely shone through. And I thank you for your time. Well, thank you. It's been, it's been fun. And I've really enjoyed tonight. Thank you. So it's good night from him. Yep. And uh, a good night. And it's good night from me. And we will see you on the flip side. Indeed. You have been listening to the Doctor Who Alhambra podcast. Doctor Who is owned and trademarked by the BBC. Doctor Who Alhambra is not affiliated with the BBC or Big Finish. No infringement is intended. Visit our website at alhambrapodcast.weebly.com or email the show at alhambraaudio at gmail.com. Tweet us at alhambrapodcast. That is A-L-H-A-M-B-R-A podcast. Thank you.